Coming up on Windows Weekly, we find out what's in store when the IE9 beta comes out next month. We also get a little insight into Microsoft's finances from the financial analyst meeting. It's more exciting than it sounds, and we unlock God Mode. All that and more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 168, recorded August 5th, 2010. The Halo Effect. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Astaro Corp, makers of the Astaro Security Gateway. Contact Astaro at www.astaro.com or call 877-4-ASTARO. And also by GoToMeeting. Visiting important contacts from New York to L.A. and Bangalore to London is time-consuming and expensive. Have meetings online instead with GoToMeeting. For your free 30-day trial, visit gotomeeting.com slash windowsweekly. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers everything Windows with Paul Therott, news editor for Windows IT Pro, man in charge of winsupersite.com, and the author of Windows Phone Secrets. Good day, Paul. Good. Yes. I say good day <laughs> good because day. you're on the other side of the world, and I actually, could, yes. I don't know if it's afternoon or morning or, or what it, it is. is. Yeah, it's 8 o'clock at night. It's evening. It's yes. so bright in there. Yeah, I think the sun goes down at about 1130. Oh, wow. So. <laughs> I didn't realize Germany was that far north. Yeah. No, actually, I think we did a podcast last year from Amsterdam, and as we as we recorded the show, it got darker behind me, so maybe <laughs> <laughs> maybe that will happen here. Well, we'll just watch the sun go down. Uh, yeah. Well, Leo uh, is now, last week, Leo was off in Detroit. Uh, when we recorded, uh, taking part in Maker Fair and visiting the Ford plant in Dearborn. Uh, this week, he's just gone off on vacation. He's just gone. Yeah, he just, he's Does like... Does he get to do that? I don't, not showing up. I must have misread the contract. It's a, I'm, I didn't realize he got vacation time. Yeah, I guess he, he awarded it to himself somehow. <laughs> he did, so yeah, it was a bonus. Sneaked it into the bylaws. <laughs> nice. Uh, but so uh, we got some, some Windows Phone Secrets news, do we? Yeah, of sorts. I mean, <laughs> it's like a meta news or whatever. Um, so, yeah, last Friday, it's hard to think back. I can't believe it was that long ago. But, yeah, last Friday, I uh, finished writing the book. And, and I used the word finished with the, uh, you know, the air quotes. Right. Um, but I finished the first, you know, the major writing part of the book, I guess, which is a big deal for me. Um, of course, now I have to do all the other stuff. And that involves uh, author review and, and handling all the edits. And, and I've got additional content I still have to write and so forth. But the one thing I wanted to, I was just working on this before you buzz me here, is I'm, I'm starting up a, uh, we do a Windows 7 feature of the week here on the podcast. And on the site, I call this uh, feature focus, you know. And so I'm going to be doing a, a Windows Phone 7 feature focus and I was just actually working it up. So I, I, was, I guess I'm just asking people if uh, they're interested in learning about specific features um, to email me and let me know because I'd like to do them in the order that makes the most sense for people who are looking to learn about Windows Phone or whatever. So I don't have to go through it from A to B. Um, and I'm not sure how uh, the speed at which I'll get this done. I don't think it will be done before the phones ship. But once the phones do ship, I think we'll switch here on the podcast to do a a Windows Phone feature of the week, you know, mm -hmm. um, sometime later in the year. So yeah, that makes sense. When it, once it's yeah. new, people are getting it in their hands, want to figure out how yeah. to make use of it. Well, I think we, I think I made the mistake in the past. We talked about Windows Seven a lot before it came out, uh -huh. and then I got people writing me saying, "Hey, I have this vague remember, you know, I re remember vaguely you said something about this, but I don't, you know." And it occurred to me that. Uh, you know, people don't get this stuff uh, early, so maybe I should discuss it when they have it. So I, I think for Windows Phone on the I, podcast, I'll, I'll wait. I did the same <laughs> so. thing. I did the same thing in Windows 7. I was working at CNET doing all the how-to tips, and as soon mm -hmm. as the, uh, the the release candidate came out, did all the tips, put them on video, published yeah. them. By the time Windows 7 came out, they're like, I'm like, they're like, do all these tips. I'm like, I already did them. They're on video. They're like, yeah, but yeah, you say like, release candidate. You got to reshoot them. So yeah. it says doesn't say release candidate anymore. All right. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard because uh, obviously uh, when you're watching the industry as we are following the industry, 
you find out about the stuff very well in advance. And I, I can't remember everything that I do explicitly, but I, I have this vague understanding that I've, you know, I've talked about this before, haven't I? I mean, did we, didn't we do this uh, two years ago? Yeah, <laughs> right. But, right. you know, obviously to be useful to people, it should be when they can get it. So we'll try well, to be a little... Uh, you're, we're going to face another one of those problems with Internet Explorer 9, right? Because it's heading out into yeah. beta next month. Right, right. Nice nice segue, by the way. No, thank you. Um, <laughs> that was very, very professional. Um, <laughs> Thanks for pointing it yes. out. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm a little punchy today, sorry. No, no worries. Yeah, so Microsoft, uh, you know, back in, I don't know, <laughs> I forget now, March, uh, I want to say March, released the first platform preview for the next web browser, right, Internet Explorer 9. And at the time, they kind of talked up the, 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 the vague ideas they had around what they wanted to improve, you know, performance, status, compliance, and so forth, hardware acceleration of uh, text and graphics, audio, video, etc. cetera. Um, and then they promised that they would release a new platform preview every eight weeks after that. And actually, they've, they've been ahead of schedule. And this is really kind of a first for Microsoft. You know, I, and, and they acknowledged that, actually. It was interesting. I talked to them this week. And, um, you know, they said, we've never done anything like this, especially for something as broadly used as IE, you know. And they're really excited about the feedback they've gotten. And I th I, I'm hoping that this drives some kind of a change at the company in, in a broader sense because... Uh, this is the type of development I think they need to be doing um, across the board. I mean, I, I really like the way they've handled this. But so they've they've shipped four of these platform previews, and of course, the platform previews are developer oriented. Each time there have been performance improvements, imp uh, improvements to the standards compliance, uh, feature additions, you know, hardware accelerated, this or that, depending on the release and so forth. Like the, uh, for the fourth preview, I think it was hardware accelerated SVG graphics, for example. There's a nice dancing hamster demo if you're into that kind of thing. Ah, yes. The hello <laughs> they're world. Promising. Yeah, you got to have the dancing hamster. So for next month, they're going to release the first beta. And what they've decided to do is keep on the same schedule where every eight weeks now, they're going to release another beta until it's, it's done. And they're still not saying when it's going to be. How do they, um, like with the platforms, it was P1, P2. What, how will they yeah. distinguish the different betas? They haven't said, but I think beta one, beta two, just numbers. like that. Yeah. yeah. So it's conceivable there could actually be several betas. You never know. Uh, we'll see. I, I still don't expect to see this by the end of the year. But then again, you know, the language they're using to describe this platform preview is very similar to the language. And, when, and I say that when, I, when they speak to me, I mean, um, the language they used to describe this platform preview was very similar to what they used when Internet, I'm sorry, when uh, Windows 7 hit that first beta that uh, at, at PDC in 2008, where it was essentially feature complete, you know, behind, you know, and they were looking to fix bugs and speed, you know, speed the performance and all that kind of stuff, fine tune it. Um, when they talk about Internet Explorer 9 as a platform, as they did this week, you know, the language they used was like, we're there, you know, like, if you look at this platform preview, this is pretty much the underpinnings of the browser as it's going to ship, you know, whenever that is. And uh, that's really interesting because it suggests that um, this thing could, in fact, ship more quickly than I thought it might have or might. Um, because, obviously, there's a team working in tandem um, on the UI stuff and whatever end-user features may, may, they may have. So, if, if it follows the trend with the platform previews, I think we could see some new features in each of these beta releases. You know, that the point of the betas will be to slowly reveal... Over time, you know the new UI and whatever end user features they have. So, it's pretty it's it's pretty interesting. And you know, we had that question last week from someone who asked me if I liked the direction they were going. And you know, yeah. But it's funny in talking to them and and seeing how serious they are about um, you know people uh, web developers using IE9 not as an IE but as a standards compliant browser. You know, they want people to not look for IE but you know. Uh, look for feature compliance, right? That if that this thing should run a lot like, say, Chrome does from a, um, a compatibility standpoint. You know, it's really exciting because that's not the way IE has ever been. Is that the so, difference between IE8 and IE9 mostly? Is that, is that change? Yeah, I mean, there, there are artificial and semi-artificial ways to look at it, like the ACID-3 test where I want to say IE8 
you know, scored some horrible uh, thing, 24 or 32, or whatever the score was. Yeah, the smiley the did not look good. I, that's all I remember. No, 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 it was terrible. And, uh, well, actually, the new, uh, the acid three test is a, uh, it's like a, a color gradient or a, you know, like a rainbow type of thing, I think. But, you know, the new version, uh, IE9 platform preview four scores 95 out of 100. And what they've said is that those five remaining points are based around things that are actually in flux right now. Mm -hmm. And I, clearly they intend to, to get 100 on that. Um, I, that's semi-artificial to me. There are things like the Sun Spider JavaScript score, which is a, a performance benchmark where IE9 is now neck and neck with the fastest browsers out there. Um, and then I think the more important thing, and this was true with IE8, any web browser really, is just the, the real world performance. And that's not something I'm going to even think about with these platform previews because this thing needs to be loaded down with whatever UI it has before that is a, a fair measurement because that's part of the real world, you know, testing that will occur. But I mean, I, yeah, so far it's interesting. And, and you know, is this good enough, you know, to pull power users off of their, uh, you know, their Chrome or Firefox browsers, or whatever, you know, who can say? But, I, you know, if the goal is to, you know, keep people from running away to those browsers. I mean, I think this is an interesting, um, an interesting release. Yeah. Well, they've got a leg up on that with IE8. I mean, we're we're seeing uh, the market share start to level yeah. out or shift back in Microsoft's way. They're getting, they're gaining some momentum. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny uh, when I think it was about a month ago they announced. You know, or it was announced that um, Internet Explorer had in fact gained share. You know, for the first time in quite a long uh, time. And at that time, I looked at the market share numbers, you know, for the past six months. And actually, it's funny because even though everyone was very quick to report that IE had been losing share over time, the truth is it really had kind of leveled out, mm -hmm. you know, and it had leveled, it had basically been leveled this year. Um, you know, they made a small gain uh, last month. They made a, a, a small gain again the next month. But, you know, it's almost, you know, this is a trend now, isn't it, right? So we have, we have two months in a row that, uh, you know, this thing has actually gone up. So, uh, I, I think that combined with the fact that, um, you know, IE8, you know, specifically the, the, the shipping version of IE is in fact the most frequently used web browser on the internet by far and actually grew more last month than any other browser. In fact, most browsers lost share, you know, Firefox and Chrome both lost share last month. So, um... Well, Fire, Firefox I mean, definitely lost some share. Chrome, you can argue, yeah. is uh, flat or losing uh, depending yes, on what your I'm, statistical I'm using, I'm using that same metric that we applied to IE to back IE, in March. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah, I hear you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but, the, yeah, the bigger news is to me is that IE seems to be eating most of this this gain from Firefox, which is a, a big change. Yes, right, right. Yeah, and, and you know, it's, it's funny. <laughs> it's always interesting to me. Um, there are different ways you can read statistics, right? Um, I have, I've always done this, you know, with regards to the Mac, um, I've always said in the past, you know, Apple would come out with some quarterly statement and we sold X number of Macs and we sold, you know, shipments were up 33% year over year, you know, much higher than the industry average. And I would do the market share calculation. I would say, oh, look, they went from, you know, 3.35% of the market to 3.37%, you know, that it's really hard when you're starting from a small place to make big jumps. Um, although, by the way, Apple did just do that in the most recent quarter. They made a, a, a tremendous jump uh, market share wise. You know, I've been fascinated to see people apply that logic to Microsoft in other markets, you know, whereas they never would have <laughs> written that about Apple, you know, and uh, IE in the past, you know, one of the things that people used to always say as IE8 grew, they would say, well, yeah, but it's just picking up share from IE7 or IE6, you know, and uh, I think we've actually gotten past that finally, you know, that there's, there's no way to parse this where you can say, oh, well, you know, <laughs> they did something artificial. You know, the, it, it's interesting that this is happening in a way. I, I, I think arguably for Microsoft, you know, uh, I don't think they're ever going to get back up to 80% market share or anything like that. But um, the greatest thing that ever happened to the web for consumers was the introduction of Firefox and then eventually Chrome, where you have browsers that are actually competing on features and on standards compliance and on things that really matter. And that drives Microsoft to make a better product. And that in the end, whatever this split is between these browsers... It, all, it really doesn't matter in a way, as long as they all adhere to the same standards and they're all rock solid in different ways. And I think that's what you're seeing, you know, that Microsoft uh, specifically does their best work when they have competition, you know. 
And uh, so whatever happens with I-8 or IE9 in the future, whatever. But I think that the, the neat thing that's come out of this is just that it's forced, you know, the competition has forced Microsoft to make a better product. So, so we, we should cheer for IE8 to stay flat. Otherwise, yeah, the, the, that's exactly what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, yes. they'll get a big I head. Will be, I will be doing that myself. <laughs> well, you, yes, you don't want to get them. Well, they're never going to get to ninety percent. I think we need to be honest about that. I mean, we don't. There's no worry there, right? Those they're days not, are over. Yeah, I yeah. think so. Yeah, I think so too. All right. Well, we're going to talk about the uh, Microsoft shortcut vulnerability fix in a minute. But first, I want to thank our sponsor, Astaro Corp, maker of the Astaro Security Gateway. If your smaller medium business network needs superior protection from spam, viruses, hackers, and which one doesn't, uh, as well as complete VPN capabilities, intrusion protection, content filtering, and an industrial strength firewall, all in a single, easy-to-use, high-performance appliance, you want to contact Astaro at astaro.com. Or you can give them a call, 877-4-ASTARO. Just spell it out on the phone. And schedule a free trial of an Astaro Security Gateway appliance in your business. Uh, they, they released Astaro Command Center V1 not too long ago. Free for users of the Astaro Security Gateway. It lets network administrators manage and control multiple gateways from a single dashboard. It includes a world map. So you can you can play uh, command center. You know you can you can move instead of moving the pieces around on the board. You can actually visually locate and control gateways no matter where they're located. Your monitoring capabilities show at a glance the threat levels and resource usage for all the gateways in your network. And ACC, the command center, can coordinate and manage remote gateway maintenance, startup, and shutdown for network admins with multiple offices connected to the internet, or who have multiple remote locations like stores or plants. The Astaro Command Center makes managing network security simple. You can download Astaro Command Center V1 from the products section at www.astaro.com. So let's uh, let's talk about the shortcut vulnerability. It was the one that uh, when you browsed to either a USB drive or even a, a certain network locations, just mm -hmm. viewing and loading the shortcut could own your machine. And they finally put out a fix, right? <laughs> Yes, they did. Um, I haven't had a chance to test this, and I, I probably won't, uh, to be honest, given that I'm away and whatnot. But I did get an email from uh, somebody, uh, I think it was Marlon Hollis, who noted that if you applied Microsoft's workaround previously, which made all of your icons white, uh -huh. and then installed the patch, uh, your icons stay white. So if you want the icons to come back, you actually have to uninstall uh, you know or reverse the workaround if you will well that makes sense uh, because it was was it a registry hack right yeah so the fix isn't going to change the registry hack you're gonna have to yeah it, it seems like maybe they should have done that actually you know or at least looked for it check um, for it simply yeah. because people would have done that you know um especially since tested, microsoft sorry. recommended that workaround <laughs> yes yes yeah i love the uh yeah it's you know it's like saying uh you know windows nt is the most secure computer operating system in the world assuming you don't plug it into a network yeah right uh, which was actually a claim at one time, by the way. Um, so, okay. So uh, I think everyone's up on the fact that there was a, this shortcut um, vulnerability. is kind of a zero-day attack. You know, Microsoft released this um, fix, I think it was on Monday or maybe Tuesday, this week out of band, meaning uh, before their regularly monthly scheduled security update cycle, which is next Tuesday. So it must have been Tuesday. I don't remember. I, yeah, I think it, it was announced late Monday or, or dropped late Monday, yeah. and then most people got it on Tuesday. Yeah, it requires a reboot, all that kind of stuff. I, you know, this one was clearly very serious. <laughs> so uh, I ensured that it was installed here on the computers. I had my wife, you know, install it and reboot and all that. Um, I, I think the big news is just that it's out, so you should get this. This is one yeah. you should absolutely get uh, and not screw around with. It's was not... Uh, was there a lot of this in the wild that, that you'd have to look out for? I mean, just not plugging in USB devices was, was one way to prevent, not, you know, being careful what yeah. network locations you browse to. Well, I think there were other ways to trigger it, right? I think you could have downloaded a file that would have done this and, and so forth. Yeah, you know, one of the reasons they delivered the fix early was that Microsoft saw that this was, in fact, uh, escalating mm -hmm. around the world. You know, the different countries, especially, that were in particularly dire straits. Uh, but it was, you know, the United States, parts of Europe, Brazil, et cetera. There were lots of places where uh, copycat attacks were happening. And, and you, you kind of have a sense from the past of how these things go that there's a snowball effect that occurs, you know, uh, that once people start copying successful hacks, it gets worse and worse and worse. And it, it uh, you know, right. goes up exponentially. So Everybody's got to try it, right? 
Yeah, so they didn't it. wait, so yeah. they put it out. So definitely go grab that one. That's, uh, that's a big deal. There's, there's no doubt about that one. Microsoft also had their annual financial analyst meetings. Uh, anything important roll out of that? Yeah, now we we could talk about this one for an hour, but I, I just want to hit some of the broad strokes because um, Microsoft has this meeting every year with financial analysts. It's a one-day thing. It, ha it happens at their uh, Redmond campus. In years past, the way they've done it is they've carted out their senior vice presidents, the people that are responsible for each one of their business divisions, and they let these guys kind of go through their little spiel. Like, uh, the last year was fantastic, the next year is going to be even better, and here's why. You know, And this is one of those, I don't mean to say lying with statistics, but you know, with a company as large as Microsoft, there are all kinds of different ways to present information. You know, And uh, they have so many different businesses. You know, So it, it's fascinating to me to watch them uh, point to businesses that frankly aren't doing very well, but you can, you know, kind of explain it in a certain way that makes it look very good. So for example, there's something like Bing, which is a fantastic service. I, I, I think that Bing is is innovative in ways that many Microsoft products aren't. I, I think that it's a it's a, an excellent alternative to Google. It, it does certain things very, very well, especially. Well, it's the, it's the um, Firefox and Chrome to there you go. Google's yeah. Internet Explorer. It's, yeah, it's literally providing because that you've seen Google actually copying yeah. uh, Bing features, which is fascinating. Um, but we're talking about a product that has 12.7% usage share uh, worldwide um, and not starting from zero, right? There was a prior search service there. It's not like they just right. turned the thing on and got 12%. I mean, the other one had 8 point something percent or whatever yeah i mean i think uh, the first month of bigness it was nine and it was up from like you say like eight something eight point yeah. something yeah yeah so they've had those kind of very st steady but meager gains you know every month um but of course what they can say is well we've only been out for 30 percent, but we have a 40 percent gain <laughs> you know over our pre previous markets here uh, well okay sounds pretty you impressive know, we went yeah. from eight to twelve yeah that, okay <laughs> you know we had such um, a small number our gains are huge yeah, yeah. So, and also interesting to me is, you know, they, they did not bring out the executives like they did before. They, they did have executives out on, on the stage, but they didn't actually bring out the people responsible for each one of their businesses. And I, I have to wonder if part of the reason is some of these people may be leaving the company. We know mm -hmm. some of them are, you know, like Robbie Bach, for example, uh, who heads up or headed up the entertainment and devices division is leaving the company. Now, in the years past, he came out and talked about all the you know, the Xbox, the Zoom, the phone, and all that stuff. This year, they had uh, this Microsoft CEO, Steve Ballmer, talk about the uh, company's consumer business, right? Now, the consumer, and there were some interesting numbers around this, you know, and I think we, we might have touched on some of this last week. I can't recall, but um, one of the, if you do the math on what they said, basically, if you look at Microsoft's business overall, 65% of the money that they make comes from businesses and 35% comes from uh, consumers and but you have to think you know i mean what so what is the consumer business like what, what how do they make money off consumers it's from windows it's like almost completely from windows you know the only uh, they have office uh which has done actually pretty well at retail in this most recent version but when you look back over the past year you're basically talking about windows which has got to be about 95 percent of it and then some xbox stuff you know although they uh you know, as I've tried to point out so many times, I mean, this is a, a business where they, they spent somewhere to the tune of $5 billion in R&D. They had a $1.2 billion warranty repair bill. I mean, this is not, I mean, they can talk attach rates and all this stuff, which they do. But the truth is, at the end of the day, um, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's going to take a long time. Well, and for even, that thing and even with Windows, it's not people going and buying boxed copies of Windows. They're buying computers, yeah. and the computers all have Windows. I mean, unless they make yeah. a choice specifically to buy a Mac or to buy one of the few Linux desktops out there, when you walk into a store, you buy Windows. So uh, you can almost consider that akin to an enterprise level situation where you're selling yeah. in bulk to a mass amount of people I, I honestly don't think they know how to do anything else you know I, I, I this thing this one type of sales strategy has been so successful for them uh, in fact one of one of the other parts of the this fam uh, the, the financial analyst meeting uh, I think it was Kevin Turner who was talking about how uh, Microsoft intends to completely turn the business around to be cloud focused and that some huge percentage of the developers will be working on cloud computing-oriented, um, you know, products and services over the next year. 
Um, that's a, a major transformation for a company that, like I said, you know, has never been successful doing anything other than, you know, selling these things in bulk, either to PC makers, uh, to consumers, or uh, to enterprises through uh, volume license agreements. It's really interesting. I, I'm, I'm curious to see how they deal with that. But lots of, I mean, I, again, we can't go through all of this stuff, but, um, you know, they had some figures around. They talked about how they had actually picked up a uh, laptop market share in the U.S. from Apple, which is such a bizarre subset of the market to even mention you have to wonder how far they had to look before they could find something like that yeah or they wanted a story to tell against apple that's for sure clearly yeah they they talked about how you know uh, somewhere in the order of 350 to 365 whatever it is million computers are going to be sold this year meaning almost 1 million uh you know copies of windows every day because windows doesn't go out on every single one of those computers obviously um but they're saying that uh, next year they ex uh, they expect over 400 million computers to be sold and you know the message there is is really a response to the critics who uh, mentioned that a lot of microsoft's business is a legacy and you know their point is yeah okay it's a legacy market but it's also a growth market right you know? it's a so, good legacy to have yeah it's not it's not so not so shabby you know to be in um obviously there was a lot of slate pc talk i think we did talk about that last week we don't have to go into that too much um Talk, uh, Microsoft talked about something called uh, a personal cloud and also a, a private cloud. And I think the personal cloud is this notion of, you know, Windows Live services and, uh, you know, Bing and, and Xbox Live and the Zune stuff all sitting behind all of their major platforms. You know, Windows on the PC, Windows Phone on the phone, and then Xbox 360. Playing a game the on Phone 7, picking it up on your Xbox, that kind of stuff. Yeah, or uh, maybe you're on your PC and you you know you see that one of your buddies is logged in and you don't know that he maybe did that on the phone or he did it on the Xbox, but it doesn't actually matter right. because you can chat with him in real time either way. Um, that kind of stuff is actually um, this is pretty exciting. It's it, it's it's uh, it's interesting. I mean that's that's interesting. And then they're also talking about the notion of a private cloud, which is basically just uh, um, <laughs> I think trying to get businesses not to be so afraid of the cloud. You know the notion that. Uh, you can host these things internally. That really, and it's sort of an admission that when we talk about cloud computing, it's it, in some ways just another word for um, a, a computing model that's actually pretty pretty well known and familiar to everybody. Yeah, it, would, it will install a, a, something you don't have to worry about. In yeah. other words, yeah. Is there any and talk I, of the personal private cloud, like a Windows Home Server type situation? Or are they? I, I you know, I was really disappointed. Uh, in, no, because. There were areas where I thought that things like Windows Home Server or some of the small business server stuff should have come up and didn't. Um, I think it was, and let me look, check my notes. I think it was Kevin Turner who started off. Yeah, Kevin Turner started off talking about uh, the business that he fills doesn't get them any credit at all. And he was talking about small businesses. And I thought, that's fantastic. This is a big pet peeve of mine. Mm -hmm. And then he never mentioned any of the new small business stuff that's coming out this year from Microsoft, which is really exciting. Um, one of those products, the Aurora product, is the one that's based on Windows Home Server. Right. Um, there's some amazing stuff in there. And without, you know, going down a completely separate path, I mean, when you look at small business server, server Aurora or you look at Windows Home Server, the current version or the next version, whatever, you know, they have this drive extender technology that lets you plug drives into a box and just seamlessly extend the storage, you know, uh, without having to worry about drive letters or any of that kind of stuff. And, and that stuff's huge for people. And it's huge for small businesses where you don't have an IT staff that can handle something like uh, DFS or some of the more complicated, you know, RAID type things or whatever. Um, it's just, it's as exciting as business computing can get, yeah, right. <laughs> if you will. Um, but it's, it's neat. And I was really disappointed that he never, you know, he never brought that up and I don't really, uh, I, I don't really know why, but I think he was really trying to push the notion of, um, of the cloud stuff, you know, and, and for, and even on the, in the case of the small business server stuff, looking forward, um, you're talking about a situation where maybe you have local storage, like the drive extender stuff in Aurora, but, your email and your calendar and your management stuff is all hosted externally, hopefully by Microsoft and, you know, not by, say, Google <laughs> or whatever. Um, he had some interesting comparisons to some of Microsoft's, you know, business um, uh, competitors, you know, VMware, uh, Linux, Oracle, et cetera. But, you know, but uh, some of these are good points. Some of them are not. You know, Linux has actually lost market share in the server market over the past few years. Windows Server has actually gained market share. Um, okay, that, to me, that's a good statistic. You know, when he, he looked at, when he talked about Oracle and, and, and competing with SQL Server, he noted that Microsoft's database-related revenues rose 6.2%, uh, which is actually 10 times faster than Oracle. Okay. 
<laughs> but I mean, is the Oracle, you know, the Oracle total revenues 10 times the size of SQL Server? Probably not that much, but mm -hmm. if they're, you know, clearly that's the case where they are in fact bigger. So um, it's kind of, uh, you know, hiding one truth by talking about another, I guess, is the way I would put that. So the trend here and, and, and the things you're telling me is a lot of stretching to find good news when most of the good news where, where, is really where it just doesn't windows. exist. Yeah. Well, there there are some there are some that that's notably good news. Yeah. yeah, sure. So, I think uh, Windows Server a big success story. Exchange is a huge success story. Um, they've been kicking, you know, Lotus Notes to the curb for years. They had some interesting statistics around that. I don't even know why IBM even makes Lotus Notes anymore to be honest, but Well, that's like uh, kicking it, somebody who's passed out. I mean, that's Yeah, that's exactly. Just not it is, fair. Yeah. I yes, absolutely. Um you know they're they're not doing well. I should say they have not. How do I say this? Uh, they came out of nowhere with virtualization. So now Microsoft has something I want to say about fifteen percent of the market uh, server virtualization compared to about thirty thirty one percent for VMware. Um, so VMware grew a little bit. Microsoft went from zero to fifteen percent in about two years. Um, that's pretty impressive. You know, of course, Microsoft bundles their virtualization solution with server. So. There's always going to be the people that argue about that stuff. Um, you know, Office is obviously kicking ass for Microsoft. I, I think a lot of the, I think the big weakness there uh, at the company is the consumer stuff for the most part. And when you look past Windows, basically what you have is Xbox, right? Xbox is certainly successful in the sense that people love it. You know, it may be one of those uh, Stockholm syndrome things because you know the, they fail every three months, but we just keep going back. You know, <laughs> mine is have, never. I mean, I sh I'm not going to say. Don't that, say that. I don't say it. I, I, I have not had to send mine. I'm not going to say anything, but you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah. How old is it? I bought it. Shoot, I bought it two months after Years it came out. Yeah. Oh wow. Yeah. That's by the way. Maybe a record. Yeah. <laughs> I should probably submit it to Guinness or something. You might, yeah, put it to the, give it to the computer museum, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Like oldest running, continually running Xbox hardened, in history. Hardened Xbox. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I honestly think that Microsoft, you know, when you look at the cloud stuff, their business-oriented stuff is simple. It's going to work great. It's going to sell well. No problem there at all. I think the trick is going to be con convincing people because, you know, people, individuals, you know, people are used to, having their stuff all over the place. And, and I think they're okay with it, you know, uh, regardless of whether that makes sense or not. So they've got, you know, Gmail and Google Calendar. They use Facebook. You know, they've got, they've got their stuff all over the place. And uh, I just think they've gotten used to that. And it's a problem for the future because this kind of uh, coming generation of kids that are coming up through school, this to them is computing, you know. Just to, and, when you uh, say having it all over the place, what do you mean by that? Well, you know, in the, in the past, if you wanted to get anything done, you know, the first step was, well, I have to get a computer, mm -hmm. you know, and it's going to be a Windows computer. There was no, you know, it was no discussion one way or the other. That was pretty much it. And, uh, oh, I need to have a Microsoft Office, you know. And uh, I, I think there was a lot of, there's a lot of built-in inertia there when you have, when that's the starting point. So when it comes time to look for something else, if, you know, some other, you know, product or service or whatever it is, oh, look, Microsoft also makes a photo imaging, you know, a photo editing application, or they also do this, you know. Uh, I, consumers have, uh, have proven themselves to go out and just be diverse, you know, to look to different places for different things, you know. Uh, Microsoft has never uh, succeeded at, at any of these side businesses at all. And this is more of a problem in the future because I think, you know, when I look at my kids, I mean, my kids have netbooks and they do happen to use Windows. But for them, computing is, you know, YouTube mm -hmm. and Gmail. And, yeah. uh, oddly enough, they do, they do use Messenger. And my son thinks Microsoft is the coolest company in the world because they make the Xbox and he doesn't understand uh, what an aberration that is. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but that's the Aurora uh, effect that they want. Well, not, not yeah, yeah. the product name there, but yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, the, yeah. the Halo effect. Sure. Absolutely, Much more appropriate yeah. for Xbox, I guess. Uh, you yeah, know, it's I, interesting. It, I don't use uh, I don't use Office anymore. I've got it. I almost never yeah. launch it. I'm always doing my stuff I online. Actually, my my heart actually stopped beating there for one second when you talked. When it just stopped working. Like, <laughs> it's, it's just one of the. You know, I hate. I'm gonna hate. I'm gonna hate the answer to this question. But what do you use? I use Google Docs. <sighs> I know it's just, okay. and it's not, it's not through any kind of fanboyism or loyalty or I love this no. or that. Uh, and, and now that Microsoft has its, you know, it's, it's document sharing up and live, 
it, I could easily mm -hmm. foresee a situation where I would use that instead. But it's just, uh, you know, for most of the things I need to do, I don't need all of the power and extensions yeah. that Excel oh, and I, Word provide me. I'm just not that kind of I, a user of uh, it. I probably told this story on, on this podcast, but years and years ago, I, I remember seeing Linux for the first time. It was Slackware Linux, and they distributed it on uh, floppy disks. And I remember saying to somebody, you know, what is Microsoft going to do when these guys make a copy of Office that it only has to do 10%, right, mm -hmm. of what Office does, but it has to do that 10% that everybody needs, you know. And, uh, of course, those products came and went, you know, the open offices well, of the world. Open so Office is still around. It's still very good. I use it. Actually, I've got it on no, my computer. No, no, I don't computer. mean it like that. But, in other but words, you know, the, I think you pointed possible. out the problem, which was Open Office did tried to do ninety percent. Yeah. And so you were looking at it, going, "Well, I've got one bloated piece of software or another bloated piece of software, and the Microsoft <laughs> one, you well, know, works a hundred percent of the time, and Open Office works ninety eight percent sure. of the time, and so most people just stuck with Microsoft." I, I have spent a crazy amount of time over the years um, looking at every version of Corel WordPerfect that come, has come down the pike. Every time OpenOffice gets revved, I install it. Every time, uh, uh, you know, some of the alternative versions of OpenOffice come out, I've, I've installed it. And, you know, there's something weird about them. They're just not quite the same, and I can't quite put my finger on it, but they're not the same. Um, there, there's also a side issue, I'd say. You, you see it with Microsoft. In fact, it came out during this uh, financial analyst meeting where I want to say it was Steve Ballmer said something along the lines of customers wanted Office in the cloud, so we put Office in the cloud, you know, which is kind of a uh, kind of a weird way to put it, right? In other words, yeah, we didn't right. really want to, we didn't see the need for it. Fine, but whiny enough, customers. You want your Office yes, in the cloud, I'll stick it there. People kind of bitched about it enough, so we did it. Yeah. But I also look at Google Apps or Google Docs, I guess, and I think, you know, Google approaches everything from the perspective of the cloud, you know, from the web, because that's what they do. That's their that's their deal, you know, just like Microsoft approaches everything from the desktop, right. you know. And uh, I, I just, um, it's not that it's some weird subset of what's available in Office to me. It's almost, it almost is because it's the browser. You know, if they could make a version that uh, worked consistently offline and could be run as an, uh, kind of a pseudo application like you can do through Chrome now with, uh, you know, Gmail and Google Calendar and things, you know, maybe, you know, maybe. There, there is a Google Gears version of, of Google Docs that allow you to, you know, Yes, work but offline. I mean, I, I, my understanding is that they're getting rid of that because uh, HTML5 is going to have some of the offline stuff and they're going to switch over they're to that. Or, to that instead of Gears, yeah. 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 Uh, well, all of this talk about Office, uh, we should point out that <laughs> Mac Office 2011 uh, is coming in October. <laughs> yes. If, if anyone cares. Yes, we should. Yes, we should. You should care. Although, you know, I, I get off, I get Mac Office, right? I mean, I get it. I get why they make it, right? They probably sell billions of these things. Um, you have to think on the Mac side, there are a lot of people who just want to not use it, but, you know, need it for whatever reason, and, and it bugs them. I don't know. Um, Mac Office has always been okay. I've never bought into the notion that it's, you know, the best version of anything. I, I don't, I find it to be weird. I mean, it is. and it's weird, but it, it it's weird in the context of the Mac, too, right? If you buy into the way that the Mac does things, you know, Mac Office has always been a little off, hasn't yeah. it? You well, know, the, the way uh, it updates itself, the way it installs, from, from that yeah. point onward, everything is just a little foreign. It's like visiting Canada for the first time if you're American. Yeah, it's like uh, you thought you got away from Windows Update. So, hey, let me, let me show you what it's like. Install this patch, and then when, you, when you're when done and you reboot, oh, look, now there's another patch yeah. that you didn't see before and you need, didn't need before, but now that you install the other patch, now you need it, you know? And then um, you're stuck with I, I Entourage. Like oh, my gosh. That's <laughs> yes, the start. worst piece of software right. ever created. Created. But that's changing, yes, right? In, have, tw in 2011, yeah. it is. But and this is one of the things I'm eager to see. Um, I actually did have very brief access to one of the first beta versions of this, um, but it expired um, months ago, and so I, I lost access to it. But you know, they they're making a version of Outlook for the Mac, and not that old weird Exchange client they made a long time ago. An actual, you know, analog to Outlook 2010, uh, but for the Mac. I'm fascinated that they're doing this. In fact, I don't understand why they're doing it because, especially on the Mac side, um, I, I honestly feel that if you look at the Mac user base, there are only two kinds of people. There are those people that will use those Apple applications that are built in, you know, mail and calendar and address book, and, and they work fine. They work with Exchange for crying out loud. I mean, why not just use them? Or they use some web-based clients, 
right? Gmail, Google Calendar, whatever. What is, what's the market for people that actually want to use Outlook? It's, is it, there I, the, I'll, I'll tell you, it, it may not be very big, but what it is mm -hmm. is the people in corporate situations who have Macs in, a, yep. in an enterprise where everyone else is on Windows and there are those niggling little Outlook features that somebody that they work with uses that just right. don't work with mail. And so if you have Outlook, they actually don't work with Entourage either. Uh, but if you have Outlook, they work. They, they're okay. they're going to link up. And a, a lot of those has to do with calendar invites and stuff like that, which do work okay with Entourage. They work really badly with mail. They're, if you're in Outlook and you're using Outlook, you can do all of the same things that everybody else does. How many of those people are out there? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> 16, 17. Yeah. Uh, no, th that's actually probably a significant audience. I I'm, I'm curious if there isn't some form of uh, or notion of policy, you know, that on, on the Windows side, you can apply policy in a, in a domain mm -hmm. down to clients. Uh, maybe, I, I, I don't really know how this works, but maybe on the Mac, it's possible that they can apply policies from Exchange Server down to uh, Outlook that wouldn't, somehow work on mail or whatever for example you know around passport uh, password uh, expiration and and things like that i mean maybe that's part of it but of course you have I, to I'm have the curious. you have to have the current exchange server or at least the 2007 yeah. exchange server to use the new outlook uh, and mail. so a lot of these problems that you have with mail on Mac yep. are because somebody's yep. using a 2003 <laughs> server or something like that. That's not going to change yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. No, I, actually, in my limited testing on the Mac side, I've seen things like that. You know, I know that in Snow Leopard, for example, uh, if you uh, have, I think, Exchange 2007, like you said, or newer, it does auto discovery. You can just, here's my username, here's my password, and it does all the stuff you need, and, and you're all set. But if you have uh, Exchange 2003... It just doesn't work. You know, you'd have to go through this awful configuration. And I don't believe it. Maybe it, it either doesn't work or it's just horrible to just configure. Does, it just doesn't work. You have to use some kind of IMAP yeah. thing. And it's, it's and I, a tragedy. Okay. Right, right. I, Nobody I, wants I to speak from experience there. <laughs> okay. Okay. So uh, the, if you are a Mac guy and you use Microsoft uh, Office, um, it will be cheaper in a way. Although I, I don't actually think this is cheaper. So it's only cheaper if you, if you were only going to use it yourself. So cheaper than the, way the Windows they, version, you mean, or cheaper than the yep, previous Mac version? The, cheaper than the previous Mac version. Okay. So the, the way that Office on the Mac works today is as a home and student version, mm -hmm. uh, Word, Excel, PowerPoint. It's $149 at retail. You can usually get it for a little bit cheaper. But it allows you to install it on three different computers um, on the same subnet, I think is how it works. I, I think they literally ping each other to make sure there's only three. Mm -hmm. Um, so you could, I, I don't know if you could give them out or <laughs> use them elsewhere. I'm not really sure. But um, this version, what they're going to do is they'll have that same package, but it will be $119 for a single install or for $149, which is the same price as before. You get what they're now calling a family pack, right, which is kind of Apple um, wording yeah. that provides those three installs. So really this, that price is about the same. So if you, um, were, if you were never taking advantage of the ability to install extra copies, you can save a little bit of money. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you want Outlook, um, you can get the Home and Business Edition. That's $199 for a single install, so about $80 just to get Outlook. Um, or for $149, you can get, oh, no, I'm sorry, for $279, you can get the, uh, the three install. Um, uh, the yes, the yeah, Family Business about. Pack? <laughs> family Business Pack, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. The Welcome to the world of Microsoft. Been in your family for years. <laughs> That's right. There's also, I guess, a um, an academic suite which includes Outlook for ninety nine. You know, uh, for ninety nine dollars. Um, which is the for student edition, yeah, right? Students and actual students, uh, contrary to the home and student name. Uh, right. Well, students at higher education uh, institutions, I guess, is the way to put that. Now, you have here in the notes uh, that Android has blown past iPhone uh, in the U.S. and worldwide. This is based on sales. Why is this a big deal? So, it, it, it's really interesting to me. Um, some of the feedback that I get um, for different stories, you know. And for this particular story, you know, you hear from a lot of the Apple guys who don't like to hear about Android outselling um, the iPhone. And, of course, what they'll point out is, is the Captain Obvious stuff. Well, yeah, but, you know, Android sells on... 
every wireless carrier and there are like 20 different phones and there's only one iPhone and you know well of course it, I mean of course it's uh, so you know this is like this is just like a, obviously it out you know outsells uh, the iPhone well actually um, there are two iPhones that's what I usually hear when I say there's only <laughs> yeah. one iPhone but but it's only available from one company and in the United States at least it's only available from one carrier now, I guess my sort of off-the-cuff retort to that would be, well, Apple made the choice to only sell through one carrier. I mean, that was their choice, not, you know, it's not, it's not like Verizon doesn't want the iPhone. Believe me, I'm sure if all these other carriers could have it, they would. But I think the bigger deal, and I think the thing that people kind of forget is that, you know, there are other phones that are also sold by multiple carriers. And they are Windows Phone, and, uh, Windows Mobile today, mm -hmm. and uh, RIM, um, both of which are falling, <laughs> you know, year over year. Um, so that's just because they sell this thing on multiple carriers doesn't mean they're going to outsell the iPhone. I mean, that's not just enough. I mean, obviously, the product has to be decent enough. But the other thing I think that is important is just the sheer rate of increase that we've seen. Um, Android sales are up 900%, 900%. Not 9% or 90%, 900%. You know, um, that, there's, a, there's something going on there, you know. That's this crazy. isn't just, uh, it, it's insane, you know. Um, there is uh, some evidence that Android will simply be the number one smartphone platform, you know, in the United States and or the world by the end of this year. And I think we might, uh, you and I might have just talked about this. Uh, you know, I, I actually would make the contention that Symbian doesn't qualify as a smartphone, you know, in, in, the, in the modern sense of the word. And that if you take Symbian out of the picture, which I know is kind of convenient, um, you know, because they're number one worldwide. But I actually, I'm, not, I'm unclear why they're even in this category. Um, to me, that's it's sort of a glorified feature phone or a feature phone plus. Well, yeah, that's what I think. They must be including some some souped up feature phones as smartphones because. Well, I, Symbian. I, it's a, any phone based on the Symbian platform, you know, which is I think the Atari Twenty Six Hundred of the cell phone world. But okay, um, if you take that out, uh, Android already is number one worldwide. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Android almost certainly will be number one. Um, regardless, you know, by the end of the year, I think in, in, in the United States and elsewhere. I mean, I, this is big. I mean, th this, is a, this is a big deal, you know. And I think that people are looking, and this is another one of those cases where I guess you can look at numbers different ways, but um, I don't let, you know, this, this thing over here obscure this thing over here. I mean, yes, they sell through multiple carriers, but my God. And by the way, there have been certain months here in the United States where individual Android phones have, in fact, outsold the iPhone. You know, the Motorola Droid, for example, has mm -hmm. outsold the iPhone in individual months. And I think people just, I think they just forget it. I, I think they don't, <laughs> you know, they, I think they refuse to believe it in some ways, you know. Well, I, I you uh, know, I've brought up that very thing where I'm like, well, and you have to remember Android is on multiple phones uh, because, yeah. you know, when, if you're going to compare phone to phone, you need to go to that. Like, well, there's this is the month that the droid outsold the iPhone. But I, it's a right. testament to how incredibly ridiculous the iPhone sales have been till now. But it doesn't take anything away from Android. Yeah. It's, right, right. I, like you no, say. no, no, no. I mean, and and Android, of course, iPhone like Android uh, came out of nowhere. I mean, uh, you know, there there was no iPhone three years ago. Um, yes, th they've enjoyed you know two and a half, three years now of unbelievable growth. But you know, at some point, the market does get saturated. You know, um, you can open up into international markets. You can release new models every year. But I mean, eventually, you've, we've hit the point with the iPhone four where uh, I think the figure was seventy seven percent of those sales. We're two existing customers. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's nowhere left to go. <laughs> you know, I mean, everyone who has one wants them. One. I mean, yeah. The only way uh, left to go is to put it on another carrier, where the folks who are like, "I'm not switching to AT and T," become actually yes, market. right. That's so about, that's about that, all you that has left. the same. Yeah. But even that would be, in some ways, temporary. And I think it's um, a temporary boost, right? I mean, at, at some point, you know, you, you put them on Verizon, and eventually, everyone who's on Verizon has it that wants it. <laughs> you know, and by the way, once it's on Verizon. And the growth stops there. That's everyone who wants it. I mean, let's just be honest about it at that point. There's, yeah, there's a there's marginal no amount of T-Mobilers maybe who didn't jailbreak. Yeah. But that's, that's not going to be a statistically large percentage. Right. I just think that the Android thing is, uh, it's, it's almost like an unstoppable tsunami. I mean, I, I think that this is, I, this is, 
clearly the PC of the of the smartphone market. You know, mm -hmm. it's amazing to me. What did now? Where do you think Windows Phone Seven will end up in this battle once it launches? Tech Escape yeah. actually was asking that in the chat room. Right. So. Uh, I, I think that um, Microsoft has made a comment that it, it is, it is, again, one of those things that people forget. And I think it's important to remember this. You know, the cell phone market is growing in leaps and bounds as well. And that if you look at all of this growth that has occurred on the Android and the, on the iPhone in the past year, it, it, that is a small percentage of the growth that's going to occur over the next many years. Um, so there is a place. I mean, I think the question is whether the market can withstand three, four five, you know, major players. Um, that has never happened in a PC type market mm -hmm. uh, that I'm aware of. If you, if you go back to the early days of the PC industry, when the, you know, the Commodores and the TIs and the Ataris of the world were all vying for the personal computer market, um, that was a lot of fun for a while. And there was a lot of leapfrogging and all that, but, but naturally that consolidates down. I, I think for the short term, meaning over the next, uh, you know, two, three years or whatever, I think there is plenty of room. And, and I think it's going to be very healthy for everyone. I think that, uh, you know, obviously if Windows Phone were to fail, that would be too bad. But it's inconceivable that Windows Phone won't have some effect on the Apples and the Googles of the world that because there's just stuff there that really is innovative and interesting and I think people are going to respond to it. Um, so I think the big question is, you know, where where they fall in the mix, you know. Um, but, you know, even, <laughs> even Windows Mobile, you know, 13% of the market. I mean, people forget, you know, they sell tens of millions of these devices every year. Right. And it's in the garbage can, <laughs> you know, so comparatively speaking. Um, uh, there's a big market out there. I think I think they'll be okay. I mean, I don't have any opinion about whether they can, you know, beat Android or beat iPhone or any of that stuff. But I look at the major players and I think, you know, RIM, the United States, RIM, uh, Android, iPhone, Windows Phone, certainly, I think will be the top four. It sort of reminds and, me of the, the auto market in the 80s. Yeah. You know, you've yeah. got your big four. Yeah, and then you got some smaller makers, some AMC. Yeah, so maybe uh, right. Some Palms, um, <laughs> right? Uh, Microsoft may be the Chrysler of uh, <laughs> the 1980s auto market. Yeah. I mean, who could? Hopefully, they don't need a uh, government we'll bailout. Need a bailout. There's, but <laughs> they need a Lehigh Coca though. That's for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, well they, uh, you go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to drag this uh, auto industry thing. <laughs> the auto industry metaphor. Uh, yeah. But before we get, to, we're going to do some live chat room Q&A. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to thank our uh, other sponsor on today's show, GoToMeeting. Uh, GoToMeeting is uh, a way to help meet with people across the country without getting up out of your seat. Uh, you can have... You know, an app developer in Mexico, meet with a project manager in London, uh, talk with the assembly line folks in Taiwan, all on one connection. You don't have to travel. It's not expensive. It doesn't even take a lot of time. You just get what you need done and finish it. That's why you can stay better connected when you hold your meetings online with GoToMeeting. Set up your online meeting in advance or start them on the fly. If you just have an idea, you know, email a couple people, get them going. Everyone in the meeting logs on to gotomeeting.com. They see your computer desktop on their computer screen. So you get much of the same connectedness of being there without having to stand over somebody's shoulder. You can use GoToMeeting for product reviews, sales presentations, training sessions, collaboration sessions, all right from your desk. And the best part is, because you're hearing about it on Windows Weekly, you get to sign up today for a free 30-day trial. So why not give it a shot? You got a meeting coming up. You got some collaboration you want to try? Get everybody on GoToMeeting. Try up. Try it for 30 days for free. Have all the meetings you want for one low flat rate after that. Uh, and includes phone and voice over IP conferencing for free. So all you have to do is go to meeting.com slash Windows Weekly and you can try it for free for 30 days. Go to meeting.com. We thank them for their support of Windows Weekly. Let's move into the, uh, the chat room for some questions. I, I got one to start us off, actually. It was asked earlier. Uh, Comp, okay. Comp Mike was saying, if you have time, can you ask Paul about Windows Phone 7 updates, specifically how fast will they come out, do you think, after release? Right. Um, they have not told me. Uh, I honestly believe that they don't know. Um, but they do understand uh, that for them to be successful, these things need to come early and often, and uh, that no amount of updates can be too many, you know. Um, 
I have been, since finishing the, the main writing part of the book, I've been diving through a lot of the developer documentation to come up with little tidbits. And one of the things I was really interested to discover in there was that if you have a an update that's over 20 megabytes, they won't deliver it over the air. Oh, really? That you'll have to connect it to your PC and uh, sync it you know, over a, a USB cable. And I'm not sure if that limitation applies... Uh, to system updates, or if it's just for the applications, um, I thought that was kind of interesting. And and of course, the, assuming that that is would be the case, right? That they don't want to hammer the wireless network uh, mm -hmm. with major updates. I mean, it almost makes you think that it would make more sense for them to release a lot of small updates and just do it when they can. And I hope they do. I mean, my my expectation is that the phone as I know it that I've just described in loving detail will be completely obsolete by the time the book comes out and that they will deliver something that either has other stuff on the phone when you buy it or uh, literally you plug it in for the first time and they say, hey, we have 155 megabytes worth of updates. Would you like to uh, <laughs> be like download a them? Windows I, I, computer. I, I know Microsoft. Yeah, I know them too well uh, uh, to know that that isn't coming. So I don't know. I mean, they have not done a great job uh, on the Zoom, you know, keeping people up to date with how things are going and, and when the next thing is coming and all that. And I hope they do a better job with Windows Phone, and um, I hope and expect that they will. But um, that's, yeah, it's a speculation Scott at this point. A, Scott H. has an interesting question. Are Windows Phone 7 apps sandboxed, like iPhone and Android apps? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, yeah they are, yeah. So that's yeah. There's no way I, you know at the top of my head. I mean, I'm just uh, working off of memory here. But you cannot. Uh, you have private storage. There's no way to do app to app communication. Um, and of course, you have no concept at all. You know what else is going on in the system. So there are certain things that exist outside of the application that can intrude on the application. But most of them are system based, like notifications. Uh, a phone call, for example, or a text message comes in, you know, there's an overlay that appears over the application. Um, applications have to be smart about uh, what they call uh, tombstoming, which is the, uh, you know, the, the user at any time could just click the back button and exit out. You know, you have to, the application has to be savvy to that and has to uh, have some logic in it so that if you then go back later to that app, then you, know, you pick up where you left off, and so to speak. But yeah, they are completely... Um, isolated or sandbox from each other yeah hartwell and tamahome were uh, both asking about jailbreaking or i guess you could call it rooting uh <laughs> when you're talking about windows phone 7 it, it, would mm -hmm. there be a reason to do that would there be a benefit i mean and people are going to do it in my opinion just because they like to do this kind of thing but what what, yeah. would, what would be a right. windows phone uh, 7 jailbreaking okay. community so the phone that i have is is unlocked right um it doesn't mean that other phones will be i mean i conceivably there would be phones that are locked to a particular wireless carrier. The reason I actually know this is because when we're in, we're in Germany here, you can buy uh, SIMs here that are pretty inexpensive to make very inexpensive phone calls. You know, so when you're on, a, on an AT&T plan, for example, you can get international calling. You pay, I think, six bucks a month, but then you the, the price per call to the United States goes from 129 down to 99 cents. Not a, not a huge savings, but uh, some savings. Sure. But you can buy these SIM cards here where you can pop it in your phone and you can make calls to the United States for nine cents a minute, right? Which is a mm -hmm. tremendous savings. Right. Um, I can't, it won't, the SIM that I bought will not work on my iPhone, um, which I'm semi surprised by, but I don't actually know enough about it to know why. The SIM works fine on my Windows phone, no problem at all. And uh, I, I take that to be because my Windows phone is unlocked and the iPhone is locked sure. is, is how I take it. Um, the reasons you would want to jailbreak uh, a Windows phone, I suppose, would be for that type of functionality and then for uh, for the same reasons that uh, you would jailbreak them on an iPhone. You Maybe you want to buy apps that are not um, okayed by Microsoft. Maybe people will add things that won't be in Windows phone uh, right out of the gate. Uh, maybe some sort of a... Um, like a task manager where you can kill, uh, you know, do different, you know, kill some of the system apps to do multitask or... Cut and paste, maybe? Cut and, yeah, add functionality. Sure. Um, if tethering is not offered on the phone that you get, maybe you want to add tethering, um, that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I think it's conceivable that we'll see that. We've already seen it. I mean, there's, a, there's an incredible uh, <laughs> kind of mini market out there of uh, people who trade ROMs online and do things, you know, even for Windows Mobile. So I think we're going to see some of that stuff, uh, yeah, for Windows Phone too, sure. 
Uh, Cripple Geek says, will carriers add crapware to the phone like PC vendors do? <laughs> Which uh, we've yes, seen on other platforms for sure. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the stories that came out recently was about this HT Sense, the HTC Sense thing, right? And if you're not familiar with that, uh, Windows Mobile is so horrible that HTC created over time this UI that basically replaces the top, you know, sheen of the, or the front end of the, the Windows Phone UI. And a lot of people actually really like HTC Sense. Um, you know, the problem with it, like anything on Windows Mobile, is that sometimes you get in there and you still have to get down to Windows Mobile and there's, there's no way around that. But um, HTC uh, last week or the week before said that they were going to port Sense to Windows Phone. And a lot of people wrote me and said, well, how can they do that? You, you know, Microsoft is preventing uh, phone makers and wireless carriers from replacing the UI. And the, and the way that they could do it is they can't replace the UI, but what they could do is create applications and also those live dynamic tiles that emulate some of the HTC Sense features. Mm -hmm. So, for example, if you look at the front of an HTC phone where they have that, you know, flip calendar display. There's no reason that couldn't be a live tile. I mean, that makes that would almost make sense as a live tile. And you could see um, HTC phones, perhaps, that initial view that you get on the screen, all of those tiles being their own tiles where they have customized them to look like HTC Sense or whatever. Um, so there'll be stuff like that. But yeah, you know, wireless carriers and phone makers, um, the, the crapware such as it is that will be installed on phones will be in the form of applications and live tiles. And, and those are the type of things that they can put on there. You'll be able to remove the live tiles, of course, and you can rearrange them however you want. The way that applications work is the built-in applications can't be removed uh, you can take them off of the, the start screen, but they'll always appear in that all programs list. It, I would expect that Microsoft would provide wireless carriers and phone makers with the ability to ensure that their applications likewise are not removed, but they won't be up on the start screen. So I, I guess if you think about the way Windows works on the desktop, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's like the, the programs installed, it's sort of sitting on the disk, but it's not in your start menu, mm -hmm. you know, so... It's there, but, you know, you don't have to really deal with it. Off to the side. You can ignore it. All right. I want to yep. give some love to the Zoom HD person okay. in the crowd. There are probably yep. a couple of them. Tom, uh, please ask Paul if there is an, any word on a software update on Zoom HD. No. I mean, I, I, no. I have a hope for the Zoom HD that um, they'll continue with it. I don't see too much happening with the current device. You know, compared to Windows Phone, one of the problems with the Zune HD is that just from a sheer processing standpoint, um, the processor in that device is about half as fast as the base processor in a Windows phone. So that's the problem right there. I don't. I, I want to say that it has, uh, the Zune HD has that, uh, I forgot the name of it, the, the NVIDIA graphics set, which was, you know, decent uh, or excellent for the day. Um, mm -hmm. But... You know, it's not up to the, the Windows Phone spec. So I think that the best case scenario for the Zune HD would be they replace it with a Windows Phone-based device of Microsoft's own making. Mm -hmm. And it's basically an iPod Touch, you know, Windows Phone without the phone. Um, I, that, I have to say, I even find that kind of unlikely. Um, it, they could just leave it on in market as is, you know. Um, I wouldn't expect much in the way of new applications or um, software updates other than for compatibility with whatever the new version of Zune software is that maybe uh, comes out in the future. So I don't know. I, I, I really don't know. And I'd love to be surprised in a very positive way. But I have to think, you know, the future of the Zune is in the services uh, and not in the devices. And, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised um, if they let that one go. All right. So uh, shall we move on then to the Windows 7 feature of the week? Sure. Pull out your Windows 7, folks. <laughs> well, I mean, this well, is not one week. I, <laughs> the, some, some of these are convoluted. So um, what I'll be doing with this, as I've done with some of the ones in the past, is I'll, I'll have a write-up on the web uh, by the weekend. But um, this week's is going to be about the, the various display improvements um, that are included in Windows 7. You know, uh, the integrated color calibration stuff, um, uh, high B DPI support, and so forth. You know, one of the things that we've been doing here, uh, which has really been kind of neat, is um, this the, the home that we, we do a home swap uh, every year. And we're in Germany this year. And they have a, a beautiful HDTV. They have a, 
a popcorn hour, you know, a media box. Oh, yeah, I have one of those. Uh, those are nice. Yeah, Xbox 360. I got I got a popcorn hour uh, at some point, and it was because it was one of the devices that Windows 7 Play 2 would work with, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And what's been interesting to me being here is that I get on the wireless network, and I there are two devices I can play to here. One is the popcorn hour, and the other one is their TV. Uh, their TV is actually a DLNA compliant um, you know, media streaming device like UNPP, you know, it's, 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 it's nice. Um, but the thing that we've been using more often, uh, my kids have, you know, netbooks, like I said, and we have a, a hard drive, like an external hard drive that has all of their TV shows and movies on it. And I've got one with all my stuff on it. Um, one of my ThinkPad laptops has an HDMI output on it and they, they actually left spooled up in an, uh, 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 the longest HDMI cable I've ever seen. And from the, the couch, 15 feet away, you can uh, broadcast the, the computer display onto the HDTV, you know, at 1080p. And it uses one of those excellent, I don't want to do it here because God knows what would happen to our call, but uh, there's a Windows key plus P keyboard shortcut that lets you switch between the different screen orientations when you have two, when you have a projector or an external screen attached. So you can mirror the display on each. And what we've been doing is just pushing the display only out to the HDTV. So you kind of control it from the computer. But, um, you know, what you see is out on the HDTV. And it's funny, you know, obviously we didn't come to Germany to watch TV shows and movies, but when you have little kids with you and you're just, you know, eating breakfast in the morning or getting ready or, you know, I, I need an hour to get some work done in the morning or whatever it is, um, it's kind of awesome being able to have that functionality. And, and, and part of it is this uh, you know, part of what makes it easier certainly is the some of the display improvements in Windows 7. So Yeah, I have to say, I, I, I used to have a Windows XP machine hooked up to my TV. It was a nightmare to mm -hmm. try to get it to output yeah. correctly. Windows Vista oh, yeah. improved things quite a bit, but it was still yep. Yep. tricky. You still have to fool it sometimes. Uh, so yeah. it's much nicer not have to fight. I, I, I should say, because people always ask about this, I mean, there are still some stupid limitations uh, for multi-monitor support in Windows 7. So, for example, you know, maybe you have two or three monitors displayed, you want to do something very basic like, oh, I don't know, have a different uh, background image on every screen. Yeah, you can't do that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just so dumb. But, Why would you uh, do that? Maybe, maybe Windows 8. You know. All right. Well, this, this is one you will be able to uh, play along with more, the Windows 7 Tip of the Week. Uh, yes. And I love the I love this kind of tip that you've got here. This is these are my favorite <laughs> yeah. kind of Windows tips. This one, you know, it's funny. This this dates back some months ago, and I didn't really do a lot around this because uh, I had seen this kind of thing before, and I, I I just to me this was just you know we had we've been here before. Why are we talking about this again? But actually, you know, it, it is pretty useful, and I found a lot of people asking about it, and certainly. Uh, the fact that uh, something like this exists in Windows Vista, for example, um, doesn't mean it's not useful. So there is a, what's called a GUID, which is a, uh, a very long string of uh, numbers and letters that you can paste into uh, an empty folder name. You know, so you create a new folder, rename it, and you paste in this GUID. And uh, people call it God mode, although it doesn't actually enable any new features in Windows. But what it does do is provide you with a very nice list of uh, many, actually, I would say probably all of the control panel features uh, that are available on your PC. And it's kind of, a, I, I think the reason I like it is it's not so much that it provides you with something you didn't uh, have before, but it provides you with a list of what you do have. And I think that a lot of people don't understand how much stuff they can configure on their PC. Oh, yeah. And this is just a neat way to, you know, kind of push it right up front. This is what keeps uh, sites like annoyances.org and <laughs> exactly, people exactly. who write Windows books like yourself in business is, yeah. is being able to surface all this stuff for people. Well, yeah, and, and, and in the past, you know, and I've, I've done this, this is, uh, this is almost like saying this is the computer equivalent of I, I've gone dumpster diving, which is, you know, I've actually, yeah. you, you turn on the, you, you boot up the registry editor and you literally navigate through the hive and you just look for stuff, you know, and this is in many ways what this is, right? I mean, the, the, the control panel itself is, is, is in many ways a, a front end of stuff that's in the registry and elsewhere in the computer. And, and this is uh, just a list-based way of seeing literally what I, would, what I would call every single control panel. And it's down to individual things like adjust clear type, adjust screen resolution, calibrate display color, change display settings. I mean, when you go through the list of stuff and they're segregated by, uh, 
type. You know, there are different sections like um, I can see display, ease of access, you know, fonts, getting started, internet options, keyboard, on and on it goes. I mean, there are many, many sections. There are over 300 items in this list. And every single one of them is a configurable feature in Windows, you know. And like I said, I think the, the key here is uh, sort of like the ribbon in Office 2010. It's not that we gave you anything new. It's just that we're showing you what's there. And you just, in many cases, didn't even know it was there. Yeah, and, you know, it's, and, and it's easy to see, right? It's easy to just kind of pay, yeah. speed through all that stuff instead of having to dig down and pull it up one at a time. So that's, yeah, and, yeah, control panel is a lot of in, out, in, out, in. Yeah. 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 All right, uh, let's finish up with the software pick of the week. You got something called Microsoft Bend. I've never heard of this. What is this? I have never, I had never heard of this either until uh, until today. Um, uh, Daniel uh, Aguilar, I want to say, uh, I hope I didn't butcher that. Email me this. If you go to bend.codeplex.com, you'll find a new uh, Microsoft project uh, called Bend, and Bend is a text editor of all things. Um, was, but it is a beautiful text editor. It's it looks like the Zune PC software. Um, it has a really, I think, one of the neatest effects is if you go into the settings interface it actually spins and then the screen goes black and it looks it looks exactly like the zoom pc software it's amazing i'm taking a look at the screenshots now it's it it is kind yeah. of gorgeous isn't it um but it renders fonts uh better than applications that are built into windows because it uses this i think it's based on wpf or some of the you know some of the um uh, the newer Microsoft display technologies. I mean, it, I think it might be on the website. There's a, I think there's a screenshot showing a font in WordPad, uh, and then the same text in this text editor, and it's a, it's much much nicer looking in the, in this text editor. Um, so here we are in 2010 talking about text editors, but yeah. <laughs> it's, it's but you know what? Neat, the, the text editor. You, when you're making an operating system, I understand. You just want to put a text editor that does the basic text editing. So you leave a lot of room for people to go in and mod and yeah. change and come up with cool stuff. And this one does, looks like it does a lot of the things that, you know, Notetab Plus and all of those yeah. uh, those other popular text editor replacements do as far as highlighting code and, and that sort of yep. thing. And it, it does do some HTML uh, cleanup and JavaScript cleanup, I think. Uh, nice. Some neat stuff like that in there. But, you know, what I see when I look at this is what I wish Windows looked like, right? Um, when Microsoft develops something like Windows Live Essentials, I wonder why don't they use this? Mm -hmm. You know, why doesn't it look like this? Um, you can look at Windows Phone and kind of see where the UI is going there. And you look at this and you think, well, this, this is neat. And this is something that needs to be in Windows, you know, that maybe, and maybe it will be, you know, maybe that's one of the nice surprises awaiting us in Windows 8 is that they're going to finally adopt this, you know, type style effect and this uh, graphics effect. It's, it's really, I, I find this to be very attractive. I think this is a, a, just a neat looking program. Yeah, this, uh, you, and it's their design, right? It's Microsoft's design. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's the, the interesting thing about it. It's it's not necessarily, I'm just looking through the specs. You know, don't don't get us wrong. If you're like a power user, this isn't necessarily the most powerful notepad you'll find. Well, uh, but it's but it's certainly no, it looks no, nice. I mean, it, yeah. Um, it does inline find, uh, uh, which is kind of neat, a uh, neat effect. Um, I think they mentioned in the notes that it, it works like... Um, like it does on, in Safari. Yeah, but it dims the... Uh, basically what it does yeah. is it, it, it dims all of the other text, and then it, it, in addition to highlighting the found text, it also dims the other text, right? Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a two two layers of highlighting, if you will. It's a, it's a neat, neat effect. It's really, it really pretty. It's, it may, you may say it's just pretty, but it's really pretty. And it does some good it's, stuff. It is really pretty, yeah. yeah. I know, it's a text editor. I mean, I, I wish I had more of a reason to use a text editor. It's really neat. <laughs> yeah, right. All right, well, uh, another successful Windows Weekly. Thank you, Paul Therat. All righty. <laughs> I, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate you putting up with me filling in for Leo for a couple of weeks. You'll be back in more familiar uh, environs next week, right? Oh, no, no, it's been no problem at all. I just want to make sure, we do not, do we not have an audible, uh, a need we for do, an audible? Do we, no, we do not. They are, okay. They're not on the slate, or at least that's what they told me to, this week. No so. problem. Just want to make sure. Yeah, no problem. Uh <laughs> <laughs> you can uh, you can find us what what's what's the website is twit.tv slash Windows Weekly, or twit.tv slash ww. Uh, if you want to find the past episodes and uh, have fun in Germany, Paul. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we will run into each other again. Absolutely. Thanks to Astaro and GoToMeeting for being our sponsors. And thanks to you folks for watching or listening. We'll see you next week.